This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Hello, I'm Adam Johnson, and today we have with us Dr. Lila Maribi. He's Associate Professor in the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, and the Chief of Vascular at the Durham VA Medical Center. She spent some of her early years here in New York at Columbia, but she did her medical and general surgery training at Drexel University, previously known as the Medical College of Pennsylvania. She did fellowships in vascular research at Harvard Longwood and vascular surgery at Yale New Haven. She has her Master's in Public Health from the University of North Carolina and Master's of Management in Clinical Informatics from Duke University. She has multiple funded projects related to vascular devices, veteran administration patients, and health outcomes and economics, and she has over 70 peer-reviewed publications. So we'll start today with just asking her what's her story and what brought her to vascular surgery. So I think for a lot of people, mine is similar, and it all revolved around me having a, a mentor, somebody who really meant a lot to me when I was a general surgery resident. I started general surgery with the intent of doing trauma and critical care. I liked operating a little bit more than that, however. And where I was a resident, we had an absolutely amazing vascular surgeon, a man by the name of Andrew Roberts, whose father was Brooke Roberts, who was the first chief of an academic vascular division at the University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Roberts, my Dr. Roberts, Andrew Roberts, was just such a great human being that I thought if I could just be a quarter of the good person he was, I'd consider myself a success. So I spent a lot of time with him as a resident, and he had these wonderful longitudinal relationships with his patients. He knew everything about them, how they had their vascular disease, what to do about it. He would manage some of them non-operatively, and this was in the era prior to the sort of endovascular explosion that we've seen over the last 15 years. And he understood the imaging. He ran the vascular lab that we learned in. And he was a complete surgeon. And I really loved working with him. And he was the one that got me interested in vascular surgery as a career. At what point in your residency was that, Layla? Was it early on or was it uh, later? So it was really in my third year. And one of our other faculty at the time, Vivian Gatan, had suggested that I apply for the T32 Research Fellowship through Harvard Longwood, which I applied for and received. So she was also very integral in sort of getting me on the path towards academic vascular surgery. So I had a this sort of concentration of people in vascular who took an interest in me um, and sort of pointed me in the right direction. And in retrospect, I would do everything the same. I'd still do general surgery, I'd still do my research in vascular, I'd still um, be a vascular surgeon. None of that's changed. So I'm really grateful to have had these people relatively early in my career lead me down a path that I'm very happy with. I was a third year resident when I made that that choice. And I have been very happy with my choice. And throughout your career, you've had experiences both in the basic sciences and in public health. What are your thoughts about what the modern academic surgeon looks like these days? And I think that's one of the great things about vascular surgery is there are such robust avenues for investigation in basic science, in data science, in public health. It, you know, one of those things where you can come to vascular and then go down any of a dozen different paths and still be relevant and still contribute in a really meaningful way. So I started as a basic scientist and um, had some good initial funding. I was interested in the intersection between intimal hyperplasia and the coagulation cascade. I worked with uh, Dr. Donald Silver for for a couple of years and really, really enjoyed it. And another mentor of mine, Dr. Craig Kent, asked me to come look at a job with him back in New York, which is my hometown. And there are two things. I really can't say no to my hometown, nor could I say no to Dr. Kent. So I took a job at Columbia and we didn't have basic, we didn't have bench space back in the day at Columbia. So I started working with what at the time was called Inquire, which was a outcomes-based research initiative in the Columbia Department of Surgery. And I really enjoyed it, just like I enjoyed basic science. I really enjoyed looking in data and marrying data with policy. 
And so for me, that became sort of a, na a very natural transition, it sort of came out of a need to continue inquiry just because I'm curious by nature. But without a bench to work on, I really wasn't going to start doing P32 experiments in my apartment on the Upper West Side. So I started doing this data work and really enjoyed it and found it just another way to look at the same issues that we face day to day in vascular surgery. And that's how I ended up sort of on the policy and data end of things. And that's been an, another interesting door for me to walk through because it's led to some knowledge about billing and coding. So I actually take care of a lot of the financials for my division. So I provide some added value to my division as in addition of just being a surgeon in the group. You certainly can make yourself invaluable by doing stuff like that in the group, I have to say. So. And, and, that's some, and it's something that we don't teach our trainees, which I would love that we did. There are a couple of courses out there. Um, the, a couple of the professional societies give courses in that transition from training to being an attending. And we don't sort of in an institutionalized way pay enough attention. It makes your transition a heck of a lot easier, I think. Hi, Dr. Moribi. This is Nicole. So on that subject, we were curious how you thought bundled payments are going to be, you know, how as a vascular surgery fellow or a young vascular surgeon, how we should be thinking about the financial aspects of practice or the billing aspects of practice and some of the changes that are on the horizon. You know, it's a great question. And I think it's one that every single system is struggling with. I mean, I think pretty much most of the large academic centers have associated ACO models uh, offered as part of what they offer to their patients. You know, I, I would say that the first thing is actually know, know the rules, know how to bill, how to document, how to remain in compliance, and also just be a good doctor. Put your patient at the center of everything you do and then learn the rules that you have to play by. Whether we're talking about fee for service or we're talking about bundled care and being reimbursed on population based rather than individual patient based, I think if we still do what's right by the patient, patient wins and we'll be doing what's right. Sorry for some of the background noise. Um, one okay. of the dogs decided to play with some toys. Sounds like he has strong feelings about fee for service versus bundled care. <laughs> well, they're French dogs, so they're they're used to uh, they're used to a more socialized um, model of care. So maybe Layla, would you be able to elaborate for us a little bit about what you think the future is with bundled payments and how it's going to impact future vascular fellows? Sure. Well, I think that in terms of the fellows, I think you're going to end up seeing um, more multidisciplinary uh, approaches where one specialty doesn't completely own everything that there's more discussion. And hopefully, again, if we keep the patient in the center of that discussion and make sure the right thing happens for the patient, I think we'll all end up being all right. But I think we're also going to see some critical looks at the costs of some of what we do, you know, especially when we look at, uh, you know, we've got a couple good trials out there looking at some of the big questions, such as open or endovascular therapy, whether we're looking at best CLI, or some of the newer devices out there as well. We as vascular and endovascular surgeons are really going to have to remain at the forefront of knowing what is available for our patients and how to do that well. And that's where you see a lot of the registry work coming in. So whether it's NISQIP or VQI or NCDR, you know, us understanding our outcomes is going to be part and parcel of bundled payments, because the bundling is going to be assuming that we can provide good outcomes for the population, not just for one. So you're also going to see critical looks at things that are expensive, like drug-coated balloons. And when new technology comes out, you're going to see, um, I think, a lot more questions about how does this compare to older technologies that are going to be cheaper. And what do you think the databases are going to be that are useful for this? So, for example, NISCIP is just 30-day outcomes, and so it really won't Agreed. be able to elucidate that. Something like VQI, I think you have sort of longitudinal data, at least that's institutional-based, and you may be able to get more granular as far as, like, uh, devices, but still it's a little challenging. So what do you think the best, you know, resources are for looking at that? So you're seeing some you're seeing some interesting um, initiatives between the government as well as some of these registries like MD EpiNet, where attempts are being made to sort of look to look at that registry data, but tying it to 
the CMS and FDA device data to get even longer longitudinal follow-up on these on these issues. So I think that you know, right now, VQI, you're looking at about on average nine to 12 months. If we're able to marry that to CMS data, then that gives you for the rest of that patient's life. So, and I think that as we as individual surgeons also still have a responsibility to know our own outcomes and to follow them longitudinally, even past what we're what we're entering into the registry. So, you know, we know what we do and can to continue to look at it. And this is one of the things where I think institutions do need to continue to look at their own data is that's going to be the most granular data because for a lot of these things, we're never going to get funding to study them in a controlled, randomized manner. So we're going to be left with sort of looking at the natural history of what we do over time. And so I think institutional data still plays a role. How do you reconcile that with kind of the continual transition of therapies in vascular surgery? I feel like we're always move on to the next stent, the next drug coated balloon, et cetera. It's difficult to compare what's best when we always move on before that even five year data comes out. Agree. Um, I don't know that I have the magic answer to it, but I do know that, for instance, I mean, for, for me, if you look at TCAR, so um, I was an early adopter for transfemoral, liked it, did it, um, and ha- saw some outcomes that I wasn't thrilled with. So my enthusiasm for it dropped off. And I wasn't sure what to make of TCAR until some of the trials came out, looking at Roadster and then looking at some of the VQI data that was presented at the recent SVS meeting. So I do think that asking the question continues to be important. And so I may have sort of jumped on the TCAR bandwagon a little after some of my partners, but uh, I think I finally came to the same belief that they did. Some of that's, you know, what I'd seen with transfemoral stenting. You know, initially, I was really enthusiastic. I actually went down to Houston to do some additional training to learn how to do it, brought it back, did it, and wasn't all that, you know, and after doing it for a couple of years, did my outcomes weren't where my endarterectomy outcomes were. So I cooled on it. And then I wasn't, so I didn't jump both feet into TCAR initially until I got a little excited when I heard some of the Roadster data. And then became even more excited when I saw what was presented at some of the more recent clinical meetings regarding the outcomes. So I think we still have to keep asking the questions. Um, Right now, I don't think we have a construct to answer that question proactively. I do think it's important that we keep trying to move the frontier, though. If we stagnate, we're not doing a service to our patients or um, or to our profession. What's the strategy for? You know, let's say something new comes out and there's something new published. How do you integrate that into your practice? How do you start to get the resources at your institution to do that more frequently? So that that's a great question. I think every I think every institution probably answers it a little differently. So I was pretty lucky. I came out of my fellowship with an endovascular skill set. Some people didn't. And I remember going to a talk and this question was asked, you know, how do you get endovascular skills? And somebody responded, well, just do it. And I don't think that's a um, responsible answer. I think the responsible answer is to look into the technology and the techniques, talk to the people that wrote the paper or talk to somebody who's actively doing it, seek out training, seek out as much information as you can get, do it in a safe environment. And then once you've got that safe environment created, disseminate it to everybody else. Yeah, I think uh, you put a very fine point in it. I mean, there's a real ethical tension that we all have in yeah. adopting technology, you know, because you have ways that work, things that work, and and there is a, it's very attractive to take on the new new and best technology, but you also have a patient you're taking care of and you want the outcomes to be, you know, the best possible outcomes. And I think if there's like an unmet need, if you have something that doesn't work perfectly and any anytime we have multiple therapies, you know, it's not perfect, uh, then there's then there's room for adopting innovation. So I have a question. Uh, I guess uh, you've worked on consensus guidelines across the different specialties, and, and, and especially for something that can be in somewhat controversial like PAD. How do you do that with other specialties? That, it, was a, it was a really great experience. So I was asked on behalf of the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery to be our representation to this cross-specialty consensus group um, you know, that was sort of born out of AHA and ACC. And I went in, I think, a little worried about what 
some of the other specialties were going to propose that we do. There were, you know, from the Cleveland Clinic and from MGH, vascular medicine physicians. We had interventional cardiologists. We had interventional radiologists. We had non-interventional cardiologists. We had vascular surgeons. And we had good representation from each. It wasn't that one group dominated. And the interesting thing was when we were all around the same table and all talking together, we had, the consensus was actually easy to achieve. I was so pleasantly surprised by how collegial everyone was and how everybody put this in terms of what's right for the patient. So I was, you know, concerned that when we started talking about claudicants and, you know, the because I'd read in a couple of journals, people describing a group of patients as asymptomatic claudicants. And I would note that since claudication is a symptom, you really an asymptomatic claudicant. Yep. Um, and I was really worried about these patients that had non-symptomatic arterial disease that somebody was going to suggest that we do something. And everybody in the room said, absolutely not. And so it was, it was nice to see that we had more in common than, than otherwise. And I was, I, I went, I admit, I went in with some real concerns about what this was going to sound like. And was grateful that I listened before I did anything because uh, everybody was really, it, it wasn't hard to come to consensus. We had some discussions about dual antiplatelet agent use, and we recognized that the literature really isn't strong, and we included that in the guidelines. So I will say that if we, when we relied on the literature, which is what thankfully a lot of these consensus documents do, and we look to what good literature is out there, it, we actually came to consensus really pretty quickly. So it was interesting. I, may, I, I have to say, I was really incredibly pleased with how it went and was really grateful for having taken part in it. I had a question I uh, wanted to pick your brain about. You're working on a project with Doppler analysis and getting into how we can assess the quality of flow using um, computer algorithms a little bit better. I wonder if you could talk about that. We started this project about two years ago. So this came up from a clinical scenario where I got called to see a patient with a cold leg after a cardiac issue. And I go to see the patient and somebody says, oh, but they have a signal. And the signal I heard was monophasic. And I was like, that's not a good signal. That's a problem. Let's go now. And I thought about how, what, what, the, what was the delay that was incurred by the fact that somebody had access to a Doppler but had never been trained to interpret that audio signal. So, you know, the continuous wave Doppler, it's just the Doppler and then the ambient audio. So we came up with the idea, what if you could create something like Shazam, where you collect the ambient sound and it, you know, like Shazam, it tells you what the song is and then it'll even tell you the lyrics. And we said, well, this is even easier. We don't have, you know, zillions of things out there. We just want to know, is this monophasic, biphasic, triphasic? We want to know if this is a good signal or a bad signal. So we created a curated data set of 500 audio signals and their accompanying actual vascular lab interpretations. So we partnered with the engineering group here at Duke and applied some machine learning techniques. And we tried several different ones looking at different classification schemes looking at how accurate we could get it. So we've actually got it above 92%. And we're actually now sending out a survey with those same audio clips to doctors and nurses and medical students to sort of get a sense for what the algorithm says, what the vascular lab says, and what the average end user says. So that's been, and that's been interesting there's data out there that pulse exam is unreliable. Um, I mean, we've all heard, well, you're feeling your own pulse at some point in our training. <laughs> and, the, and if you think about who's actually trained to interpret Doppler signals, it's a limited group of clinicians. And I'm sure that it, it, just like every other major hospital, Dopplers are present on every single nursing floor. So, but the number of people that are trained in their interpretation is tiny. So you've got this big gap. And if you could have a tool that would assist you in understanding that, then you could reduce that 
delay for somebody with an ischemic leg after, you know, a, a prolonged cardiac procedure or something else and get them revascularized quicker. So that was the thought behind it. And that's where we are with the project. Sort of like automated EKG interpretation. Exactly, that's exactly an, auto, an automated, um, like an automated stethoscope for heart sounds. So look for it. We're, we're, we're working on it. We're refining it. We are, um, but we're making, we've made really good progress with the project. We uh, had a poster up at last year's clinical to talk about it a little bit. And I think you're going to see more of this. I think as we, you know, we generate so much data, whether it's from our EHR or, you know, from the, on the billing side, we generate so much data that I think you're going to see more and more questions come up about algorithmic interpretation of them and ways to support clinical diagnoses. Yeah, that's really fascinating. We'd love to stay updated on the results of that when you get it implemented. I will, I will make sure to let you all know. You've mentioned a couple times keeping the patient in the center of your decision making in order to navigate the healthcare system and what's best for the patient. Um, I wanted to go back to your experience in public health and and find out what you think the important intersections between public health and vascular surgery are, as well as what you think the important disparities in vascular surgery are that we need to be thinking about and working on as young surgeons. Well, those are all great questions. So vascular's got, because atherosclerosis is a systemic disease, we intersect with public health all the time. Uh, whether it be primary prevention, whether it be understanding, whether it be access to care, those are all public health issues. You know, if you look at, you know, one of our, one of the most visible public policy things has been the SAVE Act, which allowed for a one-time screening for aneurysm disease on an individual's entry to Medicare. Um, And there have been several articles written about the SAVE Act, its impact, as well as Some of the groups that weren't included in the SAVE Act, most notably women, you know, and what should be the status of their screening. So I think that there's a lot of public health footprint in vascular surgery. And again, that gets back to an earlier comment that vascular is so broad that whatever your inquiry interest is, vascular somehow finds a way to support it. There's just so much richness in it. You know, so I have to say, I really enjoy doing doing screening events. When I was when I was in New York, you know, we were up in northern Manhattan and we would do screening events in the office. And that was something, you know, engage with the community, get people aware of what's out there, especially in communities that may not have good access to health care. I do think that as a country, we do not do a great job of making sure that everybody has good access. Uh, some of that's financial. Some of that is knowledge based. Some of that is, um, you know, you're seeing more and more hospital systems consolidate. So you're seeing rural hospitals shut down. And that has potential to be a massive public health crisis in the next 10, 15 years. You know, as all these systems consolidate and we try to localize certain things to individual institutions, you know, we're forgetting that we can't be everywhere all the time. I think that's a, going to be a worsening source of healthcare disparity going forward is what's going to be the impact of all of these hospital mergers and acquisitions. I don't know if that answered the question completely, but I know that's one of my thoughts. You know, in North Carolina, there's a, there's a relatively large rural area. And on the news periodically, you'll see that, you know, this community's last hospital is just closed down. The patients are now going to have to travel a significant amount of time to get to a healthcare provider. That's a problem, especially with vascular disease. A lot of our stuff can't wait. Ruptured aneurysm can't wait. An ischemic limb can't wait. The farther away we place the people that can give care from the patients, the worse their outcomes are going to be. So I do think that that's a concern of mine going forward. Um, and again, I think that just look at everybody the same. Talk to the patient, find out what their goals of care are, find out what's important to them, uh, whether it's, you know, the fear of losing a leg. I saw a 92 year old lady that was referred to me because somebody told her she was going to lose her leg because of all her varicose veins. Oh. And I said, absolutely not. Your pulses are perfect. You're not going to lose your leg from your varicose veins. So I said that she didn't have to come back to the office again. And she said, yes, I do, because otherwise my doctor's going to keep telling me this. You need to send him a letter every time you see me saying that I'm going to be fine. 
be honest with patients, have good conversations, find out what's important to them, basic things behind why we all went into medicine in the first place, regardless of specialty. That's wonderful. To pivot a little bit, um, we know that you're a bit of a music lover. Do you have any uh, favorite music that you play in the operating room or uh, any specific artists or songs that maybe you associate with certain operations? So actually, I don't. I have a very long playlist, which is my sort of go-to list. I'll be honest, I usually ask people in the room what they want to listen to at the start of a case. Um, And only if I disagree vehemently will I mandate my music go on instead. Uh, But I generally, whatever keeps the room happy and keeps the room moving. If I have an awake patient, I'll ask the patient what they want to listen to. But if the patient's under a general anesthetic, I'll ask what everybody in the room wants to hear. And Again, unless it's something I really, I have to, I will admit, and I know not everybody's going to like this, I am not a terrific fan of country western music. <laughs> so No one's perfect. One of my partners loves, loves, loves to listen to Journey in the OR. <laughs> I'm not the biggest Journey fan, so I will turn it off just based on principle that there's somebody different in the room now. But um, I'll pretty much, as yeah, so long as it keeps the room moving, Things that get too loud, things that are too dissonant, things that are too um, or too quiet. On the other hand, I had one fellow a couple of years ago who always wanted to listen to classical music. I love classical music, but it's putting everybody else in the room to sleep. um, So we don't listen to that. (laughs) You know, one of the things we ask people is sort of what what do they think is the the greatest failure that they've uh, learned from? The one that I've had the most trouble dealing with was was losing a patient on the table. Um, it was an operation I'd done a hundred times, went in fully expecting this to be like every other one I'd ever done. And it things went sideways sort of from the get-go. And it was really hard. And I actually couldn't do that operation for about six months afterward. Um, the only way I got back up on that horse was one of my partners called me for help on that operation, on a different patient. It took that for me to be able to do that operation on my own again. I really, it sort of struck me to the core of who I was as a doctor, as a surgeon. I I just, I really had a lot of trouble processing that. Um, And the patient's family still sends me a Christmas card every year thanking me um, for trying. And I I just, some... it's hard. I, I don't have any secret. Again, it, it took one of my partners basically saying I need that they needed me to help them for me to even try that again. And then I did. And I, I got back and I do that operation again. And I cry every time I get a Christmas card from that family. Right. Because I mean, I just their, their generosity and their understanding. I, I just just absolutely to this day blows me away they are, that they could have endured that loss and still be so open of heart. I just, it, it, it blows me away every time. Every, every time I think of it, I'm just absolutely awed by the heart of that family. I agree with you. And you have an unanticipated bad outcome. I mean, there are certain cases, you know, you go in and, and they're challenging, but if you expect it to go smoothly and you have a bad outcome it, it can be really devastating and what did you do to get beyond it i mean you said your par- your partner called you in to do the case again and did you do is there anything else you did as well or no well so you know around the time i'm grateful that i've got a group of friends in vascular surgery who i had no hesitance to call and say i need to talk you, I, I just need to talk for a little bit I, I don't need you necessarily to say anything but i need to say this and I reached out. I reached out to probably a half a dozen friends that are vascular surgeons across the country, and um, I'm just grateful that you know our our specialty is such that everybody to a person was incredibly supportive, and you know then people would share their stories, and that's when you realize that it's not a job; it's a profession. It's part of who you are. It's part of what you do every day. There were people out there that were there for me, and I'm, gra- I'm grateful to them. 
And, you know, we still, you know, things don't go as planned. Um, I know I'm getting a phone call or I know I'm making a phone call. And I'm really glad that there are people like that in vascular surgery who will support others. And it's been, you know, again, from a horrible thing to find out something good about your specialty. That's one of those things. I reached out to them. It was a while before I could even talk to my family about it. But I reached out to, you know, about a half a dozen colleagues. And for me, that was the first step in getting through. It was just talking about it. Yeah, I think, you know, I have a WhatsApp chat group with a lot of my former trainees. That's one of the things I find the most useful sometimes. Is, we know, have a Slack is, channel. <laughs> exactly. So you can uh, talk about cases and, you know, you talk about anticipated cases, but it's also a way to unburden about things. And, and I find it's been very helpful. Completely agree. Dr. Morby, do you have any um, unique techniques or something you do in the OR to get you out of an operating jam that might prevent the need to make that call afterwards? I think I think I probably do the same thing everybody else does is every now and again, get another set of eyes on things. Sometimes it's like when you're writing an article, sometimes you get tunnel vision and you just need somebody else to look at it and say, oh, well, what about this? Um, I have very low threshold um, to ask my partners for advice. I'm really grateful to have a great group of partners here and everybody, I, go, what goes around comes around. So we are all pretty good about sort of checking in on each other, making sure things are going well. And if somebody needs a hand, somebody always lends a hand. I think it speaks to, you know, a good group ethic and, you know, a realization that, you know, we all, everybody's going to need help at some point. Don't ever feel bad about asking for it. That's my best advice. What about something exciting in vascular surgery that you feel like every incoming fellow should probably know about? Uh, you know, I think, I ask, you know, vascular surgery has changed so much from when I started and continues to change. There's new stuff around the corner every day in vascular surgery. If you told me when I was applying for fellowship what my practice would look like today, I just wouldn't have believed you. I'd have said, you're crazy. You know, there's no way that, you know, 70% of my practice is going to be percutaneous. There's no way I'm going to prescribe statins for people. Um, if you had told me what my week was going to look like, I would have said absolutely no. It's gotten so different and it's so much fun. Um, I really, I, I love being a vascular surgeon. I love getting to do what I do, you know, at work. It's, it's every day. It's, Every day is a little bit different. New things get thrown at me, and it's fun to problem solve. Um, and it is fun to see what's new. I mean, I was just in a meeting uh, earlier in the week, and you know, seeing what's happening in Europe, seeing what some of the new devices are looking like, that's all exciting. Vascular is exciting, as far as I'm concerned. Um, every, you know, other specialties, oh, we've got a new mesh. Oh, new mesh, we've got a whole new operation coming down the pike. Uh, vascular, there, there's always something new. And again, whether it be clinical or research, it's, it's, I mean, I feel like a kid in a candy store. There's so much to do. That's very inspiring. It is. And we'd also like to know what you enjoy doing in your free time. So if I am not working, I am probably sailing somewhere. Um, I absolutely love sailing. I've done it for a very long time. Most of my vacations um, are occur on a sailboat with some friends, going to really neat places where we get to learn new things um, and see new vistas and explore. And I do some sailboat racing every now and again. So for me, sailing is a fantastic way to um, disconnect, to get in touch with a totally different skill set, and to spend some really good time with friends. So Dr. Maribi, we want to thank you for your time. And we just want to ask if you have any closing thoughts for our audience as we wrap up for today. Well, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to talk about to talk about vascular surgery. I would say stay excited. Va there's so much changing in vascular surgery. We have so much to contribute to our patients and to our colleagues that we should never we should never be bored. The interviewers today were Drs. Sharif Alozi, Nicole Rich, Matt Smith, and myself, Adam Johnson. And we are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. 
You can find us on social media at Audible Bleeding or online at audiblebleeding.com.